In section 11.2, we were concerned about the difference of means, but for dependent samples. In other words, the data sets were paired up. It was matched pairs data. So you take one minus the other. You take um, husbands and wives, uh, pre-test and post-test, before Reiki touch therapy, after Reiki touch therapy, that kind of thing. That's matched pairs, and that means that you're doing that particular kind of t-test. But in section 11.3, we're going to be working with independent samples, and that's going to change everything, how we run the test and all sorts of other stuff. So let's remind ourselves what the difference is. So independent sampling is when the individuals in the sample have nothing to do with each other. There's no relationship. You can have different numbers. You could have like 50 in one group, 75 in another. It's fine. Dependent samples, you can't do that. Dependent samples, it's 50 and 50, and they're going to be linked to each other somehow, like husbands and wives, one twin and another twin, or you against yourself, you pretest, you post test, things like that. So again, remember that independent samples usually are two independent groups that are measured one time, whereas dependent samples are one group but measured twice. That's why it has to have the same number of people, right? Because it's one group. So we're going to determine whether the sampling method is independent or dependent, and then determine whether the response variable is quantitative or qualitative. So a study wishes to wish to compare traditional acupuncture with usual clinical care for a certain type of lower back pain. The 241 subjects suffering from persistent nonspecific lower back pain were randomly assigned, that's interesting, to receive either traditional acupuncture or the usual clinical care. And the results were measured after 12 months. Well, that's independent of each other, right? So because they're randomly assigned, you're putting two groups of people and you're going to measure one time. You're going to measure their pain level after the 12-month mark. So the variable is pain level. Um, there's probably some kind of scale, but we don't know a particular unit. That means that since it's quantitative, you're going to be doing a hypothesis test for the means here. You're going to want to know the difference between the two groups. Now what about we want to test whether there is a difference in the body temperature of men and women. We collect a random sample of 65 women and 65 men and take their temperatures. Well again, that's very much independent. They're not husbands and wives, they're just men and women that don't have anything to do with each other. So it's two groups of people measured one time. So they were measured um, body temperature. Right, and that is your quantitative variable right there. It's body temperature. The units for this case would probably be degrees Fahrenheit. Right? If you're in if you're in America. If you're in Britain, it'll be degrees Celsius. Alright, then that means again you're doing a hypothesis test for a mean because that variable is quantitative. All right, now once you know you're doing a hypothesis test for independent means, as a matter of fact, I'm going to throw in independent means, just keeping that in mind, right? So once you know you're doing that, then you're doing this particular test right here, which is not a test you've seen before. It's the two-sample t-test. Now in this two-sample t-test, you're going to have hypotheses that look a little bit like what they looked like back in Chapter 10, just a little bit. Let me, let me bring up Chapter 10 real quick. So this was 11.2. Here's chapter 10 right here. You can see mu equals mu zero, mu equals mu zero, mu less than mu zero, things like that. Then we saw the paired one, but the paired one always had zero, and it always used a little d for difference because you're doing that paired difference. But for the two sample one right here, you're doing it a little bit differently. You're going to talk about mu one equals mu two, mu one equals mu two. The one and two are the two different groups. And your conditions are just a little bit different from each other. So let me go back here. So you want to have simple random sampling, obviously. The samples are independent. Well, obviously, we just said that this was going to be for independent samples. So of course they're going to be independent. And then the populations are normally distributed, or both N1 and N2 being your sample size of your two groups are greater than 30. Then you're going to have these kind of slightly different hypotheses where you're going to have little subscripts. We could use one and two, or we can use like men and women, or group one and group two, things like that. Now here, I, if you'll notice, I put just use the calculator. I'm not going to make you substitute by hand the way I did in the other tests. And I wrote this one up here. We will not be doing this test by hand. We're going to use calculators and our computer outputs to do this stuff. Because these formulas get pretty tricky to use. Um, and so we're not going to do everything by hand. All right, then 
we have our classical approach, our p-value approach, just like usual, except degrees of freedom gets a little wonky in here. Um, degrees of freedom is actually an extremely complicated formula. I think I have it on a page coming to you soon, right here. That is actually the degrees of freedom, this formula right here. This, that is the degrees of freedom formula. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty terrible. <laughs> so basically what I say here is we're not going to use that. Up here in the test, I say we're just going to kind of use the smaller of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1. It's not strictly according to Hoyle. It's, it's not the way that real statisticians do it. Real statisticians will use that more complicated degrees of freedom that we saw two pages later. But we're not going to do that. If we are going to be forced to do the classical method, we will actually just use whichever one is the smaller of n1 minus 2 and, or n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1. So it's a little bit different there. So we got we got some several differences. Your hypotheses are a little bit different. You got slightly different conditions. You have to have two samples be greater than 30 now instead of just one. You have to have um, this complicated formula. It's so complicated that I'm not even going to make you write it out because it's just tedious. And then you have to be careful because we're not really using the real degrees of freedom. We're kind of faking it a little bit there. And then we would compare critical values or use the p-value method, which probably is more likely because your calculator will give you the p-value output. All right, so let's stop right there and because we don't have time to actually run the test in this video. Actually, I bet you we got time. Let's, let's see it. All right, there's how to do it with the calculator, which I'm going to show you in a second anyway. So I want to test whether there is a difference in the body temperature of men and women. So we collect a simple random sample of 65 women and 65 men and take their temperatures. The summary statistics are shown below. So here are the women, here are the men. We are going to conduct a hypothesis test of these, this using the p-value method. So let me grab my calculator. I'm going to go to stat. I'm going to go to tests. And then I'm going to pay very close attention to what I said at the top here. I say what to use. It's one you haven't used before. It's called the 2-SAMP t-test. That's the one you're looking for on your calculator, which is number 4, 2-SAMP t-test. We don't have any data on this one. There's no data inform information given to us. We do have statistics information. Data, if you remember, is a big column of data. We don't have that. What we have is these values, x1, s1, n1. Okay, so let me make these smaller so we can see it. Okay, x1, x bar 1 is your sample mean, which is 98.394. S would be the standard deviation, which is 0 0.743, and sample size is 65. Then X bar 2 is your sample mean for the second group, which is 98.105. Then your standard deviation for that second group, which is 0 0.699. Then your sample size again, which is 65. All right, now we're going to have to figure out which one we're doing here. We want to know whether there is a difference. See that word? Difference. We're not saying men are hotter than women or vice versa. We're just saying they're different. That would be a not equal to test right down here. Always leave pooled as no for our course. Never, never, never change that. Just leave it pooled no. You have to do a whole other test to prove whether or not you can use yes. So unless you want to do two hypothesis tests in one, you better just leave it as no. And go down to calculate. And there's all this information. That right there. Notice the numbers we already typed in and all that good stuff. Okay, so we're going to use that to come up with our steps and all that good stuff. So we start off with the hypotheses. So we already said it, it was the difference, right? So let's see here. Mean one. So the mean for group one was men or women? Women. So group for female and group for male, you assume that their body temperatures are equal to each other. And then your alternative is that they're not equal to each other, and that's all because of the word difference in there. If they had said men are greater than women or hotter than women, you'd go with a less than. And if women are hotter than men, you'd go with a greater than. All right, next you need your alpha. Well, it says right here that you have a 0.05 level of significance, so that would mean alpha is 0.05. So that's done. Then, step three, your test statistic. Now, test statistic always happens at the third step. So we want T0. But it says to ignore, if you remember back here, it says 
in the instructions, just use the calculator. Don't bother with the formula. Don't bother with substituting. Don't bother with any of that stuff. It's not worth your time and effort. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could, because I did, but you don't have to. And you're going to get the number 2.284. Now, where are you going to get that from? That big rigmarole. Well, it's right there in the calculator. See where it says T? T equals 2.284, right there. That's all you need. So T is about, and I don't need any of this garbage if I don't want it, because this is the one test Alana is not going to make me do all that junk. So it's about 2.284. And I'm going to make a little note to myself that I got that from the 2SAMP T test output. There, I said it's from the 2SAMP t-test output. That's all we need to do. We're not going to do everything else. This is There's only two tests I'll let you get away with that in, and this is one of them because it's just so tedious. All right, then step four. Okay, well now we're going to have to draw a picture. So we're going to have to draw a t-sample test picture, which is very similar to what you had before. Now you're doing a p-value approach, so you're going to use this two-tailed one right here. So let me draw that. I'll be right back. All right, there we have it. So we have negative 2.284 over here on the left. That's that vertical bar where the gray period starts. And then we have positive 2.284 over on the right. And that's this right-hand bar, black. it's black bar, right before that gray period starts. And then the p-value is actually both areas put together. Now, where do I get the p-value from? The p-value is from the 2SAMP t out, test output. if I could spell. There we go. Now what do I mean by that? It's right here. See P, little lowercase p? That's your p-value. It's 0 0.024 and some change. All right. So remember step five, we reject always, 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 we reject if our p-value is low. I mean, if you remember nothing else about this course, remember that you want low p-values. The lower, the better, because you want to reject your null hypothesis. When you reject your null hypothesis, that's a statistically significant result. And we are going to reject our null hypothesis here because our p-value, which is um, 0 0.024, is less than our alpha, which is 0 0.05. Now, hopefully you're realizing as we're doing this, this is extremely similar to what we were already doing in chapter six, or excuse me, chapter 10. It's just that we're a little bit more complicated in our hypotheses and our formulas are a bit more complicated, so we're kind of ignoring them. All right, now what's our decision? So since we decided to reject the null hypothesis, that means that our um, conclusion, excuse me, is going to be to support our alternative hypothesis. So let me type that up one second. There is enough evidence to support the claim that there is a difference in the mean body temperatures and the average slash mean body temperatures of males and females. You're not saying who you think is warmer or colder. You're just saying that there's enough evidence to support the claim. Now, it doesn't mean that you're right. There is a chance that you are wrong, but you can't prove it. You can only prove what you have evidence for. All right, with that, we've completed our first hypothesis test for the difference in means for two independent samples. Now we're going to do it again next time, but with the computer output already given to us, and so we'll have to apply it. All right, I'll see you back here then.